Welcome back to Toronto's Air Seminar. And today's talk will be given by Keshav Chita on uh, imitation with transformers based sensor fusion for autonomous driving. Um, yeah, he is a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent System and the University of Tübingen in Hanover, where he is part part of the autonomous vision group led by Professor Andreas Geiger. Um, his research is at the intersection of robotics, machine learning, and computer vision. He is currently interested in scene representation for improving the robustness and generalization of learned vision-based control policy. Previously, he graduated with a master's degree in computer vision from CMU, where he was advised by Professor Marshall Herbert. During this time, he was also a deep learning intern on two occasions at NVIDIA, working with Jose, Dr. Jose Alvarez. Okay, without further ado, um, take it away, Kasha. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yes, um, I'm going to be talking about end-to-end -end driving today. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about some work we did last year on something called the Karla Challenge. So the collaborators who I worked with on this project are um, Aditya, he's a PhD student at UIUC. And then there's Bernhard, Zahav and Katrin who are PhD students in our group and our advisor, Andreas. The papers I'll talk about are multimodal fusion transformer for end-to-end -end autonomous driving. This is a CVPR paper from last year. And I'll also present some results from an extension to this work, like a journal extension, which is under review right now. Before I talk about the papers though, I'm gonna introduce the task we work on. So I'm gonna talk about this Carla leaderboard, which is what we use for evaluating self-driving. So, um, a lot of people who work on computer vision, for example, like most of my lab works on this, are familiar with this common task framework for research. So there's a screenshot from Papers with Code. It's a website which shows benchmarks for different tasks. So if you're working on a vision task like segmentation, or classification or detection, you have these static benchmarks, which multiple research groups across the world work on. And over time, the performance on these benchmarks goes up. And this is sort of a way to accelerate research progress on these problems. The self-driving community doesn't have a super standard benchmark, at least like a consistent one that's used by all industry self-driving developers and academic researchers and so on. It's a bit harder to do this for self-driving because you are not trying to evaluate a offline metric on a small fixed test set, which you can just like put up on a server and you need to check the metric performance on that test set. But rather you need to evaluate this dynamic driving agent and you want to evaluate its performance in lots of situations. So the community kind of came up with this Carla leaderboard to try to address this problem of not having a good benchmark. And this is a slide from German, who is the leader of this team that, it's a team at Intel, which builds the simulator called Carla, which is a autonomous driving simulator that has these um, static maps. And they define this leaderboard task as a benchmark for self-driving, where they have these fixed set of routes you need to follow on these maps. The routes have a start location and an end location, which you drive around two kilometers between to get to the end location. And the nice thing about them is that it tries to compare driving agents fairly by making every agent drive along the same routes under the same weather conditions, traffic densities, and so on. And also introduces these dangerous situations, which they call scenarios at specific locations along these routes. So for example, like when you're in an intersection, there is this scenario in which 
a vehicle from one of the other entrances to the intersection runs a red light and cuts in in front of your path and you need to perform an emergency braking maneuver to yield to this vehicle or sometimes a pedestrian or bicyclist emerges from an occluded area on the side of the street as you are driving and you need to brake for this so in this leaderboard you basically need to get from the start to the end point while dealing with traffic following traffic rules and these specific scenarios as well which occur at locations along this route and what we care about for this driving task is summarized in this metric that we use on the leaderboard it's called the driving score which averages over a set of routes this route completion term which is the percentage of the distance you got from the start to the destination so you get a completion of 100 if you reach the destination and then you have a multiplicative penalty term here called the infraction penalty which is a product of penalties for each infraction and the best way to explain this is maybe with an example there is a infraction penalty of 0.5 for every collision you make so what that means if you get to the destination without any collisions your score is 100 but if you collide once the score is 50 and if you collide two times it's 25 and so on so you get this very strong multiplicative penalty for making these infractions which uh, are not only collisions there are also penalties for running red lights stop signs and leaving your lane and so on and all of them are given sort of these um, heuristic penalty amounts which were designed by the scarla team so, yeah um so this is sort of the high level overview of the task we're trying to solve. We want to build this agent, which drives from the start to the end point. And the thing I'm going to talk about now is more into the exact solution we worked on for this challenge, which used imitation learning. The idea or like why we want to use imitation learning for the Scarla leaderboard is that we need to solve this task using a sensor-based driving policy. So we have sensors like cameras and LIDAR, which have very high dimensional readings. Like you can have millions of points in the LIDAR point cloud or millions of pixels in an image. And it's not clear how to hand design an algorithm that goes from these pixels directly to what the task expects you to output, which are like steer, throttle, and brake values. And how we sort of split up this task of doing sensor-based driving is we first use the fact that we have a simulator to hand design an expert policy, which uses privileged information. What that means is we sort of use a very low dimensional exact state space, which involves like the uh, route you need to follow sampled at a very high resolution and the uh, exact positions, orientation, speeds of all the other actors. And if you know the state information, it's easy to hand design a rule-based policy that can avoid collisions and get from the start to the end point. So we kind of make this rule-based expert and then for getting our final sensor policy, we collect a data set using this rule-based expert. So that's illustrated here. The data set has sensor readings and the corresponding actions that the expert took. And then we do supervised learning, which is essentially a regression using a neural network that maps sensor readings to corresponding action values which can then be used at test time to drive around in the simulator. So at a high level, this is like why imitation learning is like possible for this task. And Ashok, may I ask a question here yeah. already? So you, your expert, do, uh, do I understand correctly? Your expert is an algorithm itself, right? So it's not, uh, not like a human expert that was driving. Yes, exactly. So the human experts are also expensive in comparison to a algorithm, but the algorithm is not perfect. So it depends on how much time you invest into this rule based algorithm, but you can collect like thousands of hours of driving with a 
simple algorithm much quicker than with human drivers. And how good does your expert perform on uh, on the task? So, like, does it perform better than 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 the theoretically in classical IL setting? I would expect the expert to perform better than the learned uh, than the learned algorithm. The expert performs well. It's not as good as a human driver. I'll give mm -hmm. some ballpark numbers now and then like specific numbers later in the presentation. But mm -hmm. if a human can get a score of 100, expert can get a score of around 80 in the most challenging conditions. And uh, policies can get around 60, like the best ones we have right now. So you can think of it as like, it's still much better than a learned policy, but not as good as a human. If, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Cool, I'll go ahead then. Yeah, so the research question we addressed in the paper I talked about is how to do sensor fusion for this learned policy that we want in the end. So we have multiple sensors that the simulator gives us and we want to best utilize these sensors to predict the actions and the sensors we have, like the main like workhorse of like this sensing and like which gives us the most input is this RGB camera. Um, it gives us a very dense input that contains a lot of relevant information for driving. You see the traffic lights, the states, you see the other actors, you see the road layout and a bunch of relevant things. The disadvantages of only using an RGB camera though is that you don't get exact 3D information. So you don't know relative to yourself the exact positions of other vehicles and so on. And it's also quite brittle to variations in weather. So one feature of the leaderboard is that the test time evaluation conditions are unknown. So we don't know whether we are tested in heavy rain or at night time and like under what weather we need to test and camera only policies are generally less robust to these changes in weather conditions. And the other sensor which we get is like a LiDAR point cloud. This has exact 3D information, but it is very sparse. So you get only a few points and you don't cover the entire 3D space. There's also some information that's completely missing from the LiDAR point cloud, which makes it impossible to drive using the point cloud alone. For example, you don't know if you're currently looking at a red light or a green light, if you only have access to the LiDAR. And the sort of predominant idea in the research community to do this sensor fusion between camera and LiDAR is to use geometric projections between features from both of these modalities. So what that means is that you extract features from your LiDAR point cloud, which are in 3D space, and you extract features from your 2D images. And because you know the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters of the like camera and LiDAR, you can geometrically project different patches from image space to the 3D space and use some sort of network to fuse the corresponding patches. So the correspondence itself is fixed and it's based on the current geometry of the scene that you get via the point cloud. Um, this is implemented in many ways, like the 3D space is sometimes represented as a point cloud with point net features on top or as a voxel with a 3D CNN. And like there are multiple ideas which do this, but Two things that are like not so explored is doing sensor fusion directly for the end-to-end -end driving task. Most papers on sensor fusion just do object detection or just do motion forecasting. So we wanted to look into this geometric projection idea for end-to-end -end driving. And also like how important the global like large distance interactions are, which I can show an example of here. So when you use geometric fusion, the context is aggregated very locally between the two modalities. So an example here is that in the scene I showed earlier, if you extract features from this green traffic light in the image, 
the location it gets aggregated to in the lidar is this blue region which corresponds to that traffic light but for a lot of tasks that you need for navigation you ideally want to aggregate features from this traffic light to this red region in the lidar which contains the vehicles that interact with this traffic light basically because this light is green these vehicles are now going to move and this sort of global contextual reasoning is missed when you only fuse features through geometry which means some other part of your architecture needs to reason globally and you can't do this through your like feature extraction and fusion mechanism itself and transfuser is basically a idea to deal with this lack of global context in sensor fusion where we want to use attention based fusion to capture this context across modalities so specifically what that means for us is that we have this rgb image and the lidar point cloud which we rasterize into the birds eye view using like a bev projection and you therefore have like these 2d inputs which are processed with 2d cnns there's a resnet 34 on top resnet 18 on bottom here giving you multi scale features basically from each modality and what transfuser does is creates these fusion mechanisms between these feature maps of the two modalities using transformers the transformers here there is one for each feature scale and it works similar to a vision transformer you sort of get patches from both the rgb features and the bev features and you feed them all into a transformer with some positional encodings giving you the fused features which involve a pairwise interactions between like pairs within the same modality and also across the two modalities finally like when you get the processed output from the transformer which has the same dimensionality as this input you sort of reshape it back to the input dimensions and add it like a residual network and repeating this over all the features of this transfuser architecture so this is the like it's a simple idea but this lets you capture global context while doing sensor fusion from as early as the first block of your feature extractor the encoder which i showed on the previous slide is what we have on the left now in this slide but the full architecture for driving has like also these decoders on top for doing the actual driving task and we use some tricks which are common on this carla leaderboard in order to like boost performance here so first of all like if you look in the middle the main branch of the network doesn't directly predict actions but we predict waypoints in an auto regressive gru based framework so we predict basically the change in position that you want between the current time step and a certain time interval for a fixed duration so what in practice we do is we try to predict future positions for 2 seconds for the ego vehicle and then use a hand design controller to extract the steer and throttle value based on like how these waypoints look may and, i ask another question here so i'm sorry for interrupting yep um so the how how do you train this type of network do you back propagate to the through the pid controller or do you uh do you have uh, do you just extract fay points from the expert trajectory and just back propagate starting from the bay points so we do have a differentiable controller in some like we did it at some point but it doesn't help much so the pid controller the i term is a bit tricky to differentiate through but we did have some experiments where we back propagated through everything and that doesn't help much so in the end what we do is we just collect expert waypoints and the loss is basically on the waypoints i also have that on a coming slide on like the exact loss but yeah it's just the waypoints um yeah and besides this we also get some perception labels from our simulator for giving this um 
multitask auxiliary supervision. So the idea is that from the convolutional networks, we can predict things like the depth and uh, semantic segmentation of the scene, which will give you better features for the driving task. And similarly, from the bird's eye view network, we predict the HD map in the same bird's eye view coordinate frame. So these are not strictly necessary for the driving task, but we find that they're all quite helpful for boosting performance. Yeah, and the exact loss is, like I mentioned, it's directly getting expert waypoints through the expert driving logs. And we have an L1 loss. We use like four waypoints in our network and standard losses for the rest. We have cross entropy on the semantics and HD map with some weights for the imbalanced classes to increase their loss and an L1 loss on the depth prediction. Okay, so that is the core idea. So we use imitation learning with those loss functions on a data set. I'll talk a bit about our experimental setup. We have these eight publicly available towns in the Kerala simulator from which like we randomize weathers and we generate a lot of short routes and build this um, rule-based policy, which I mentioned, which uses model predictive control on that, like a very low dimensional space where you directly know the state of all the other actors. And once we've collected this data set, we also like spent some time tuning how exactly the sensor should be configured, which is part of the challenge. So we have like a very wide resolution, cam uh, wide field of view camera, and also a LIDAR, which um, it's not uh, comparable to like the very best commercial LIDAR. So you can look at this as a sort of mid-range LIDAR, which has like 64 channels and not too far range. And using this data set, like we train our policy. And one interesting thing about the leaderboard is that you're not allowed to make like too many parallel submissions to the actual leaderboard. So for all our, all our sort of ablations and internal experiments, we design our own evaluation setting, which is similar to the leaderboard, but we don't know exactly what's on the leaderboard. So we just try to replicate something like that with long routes and dense traffic. And one interesting thing I wanted to mention is that these imitation learning models have very high variance due to different training initializations. So if you randomize the training seed and retrain them, you can get quite some change in performance. So we always ran our experiments by launching three different training runs and ensembling the models, which sort of reduces this variance between different uh, baselines. Yeah. And these are the results on our internal benchmark where like I can first talk about the metrics, then the baselines, and finally the actual numbers in there. So the driving score is the main metric, which I mentioned earlier, which it consists of basically these two things. The route completion is how far you get to the goal, ignoring all infractions. And this infraction score is basically the average of this multiplicative term I talked about earlier, which penalizes you for colliding and running red lights and so on. And the baselines we have are late fusion and geometric fusion. Late fusion is a version of this sensor fusion idea where you don't use the transformers. You just have this final aggregation of the pooled feature between the image and the LiDAR branch. These are concatenated together and sent into the waypoint prediction network. This is sort of the simplest thing you can do if you have multiple sensors. And geometric fusion is like what I mentioned earlier, you build a sort of lookup table between the, the 3D, like the LiDAR feature map and the RGB feature map using the point cloud. And you fuse features between these corresponding patches using an MLP. This is based on like a previous um, object detection method. And transfuser, which is ours, is on the bottom. And the expert at the very bottom is our sort of rule-based policy, which drives without sensors. And the first thing that I would probably highlight in this result table is that the root completion of geometric fusion and transfuser are similar. 
also the expert. This is kind of within the evaluation variance. So you could say all of these have similar root completion, but they are 10 points better than late fusion. So geometric fusion seems to capture the things related to completing the root quite well already. But where there is a clear trend that is like significantly different between geometric fusion, transfuser, and the expert is this infraction score. So transfuser collides a lot less basically than the geometric fusion method. And it still is not as good at the, as the expert as, at preventing collisions. So this is sort of one of the key challenges left to reach the like maximum performance on this task. And the results on the actual leaderboard are similar. It's like, we also here have like similar um, overall scores. So we get like 50, 57 here, but the trend is a bit different. So first of all, there are like other competitors in this challenge, which use like very different methods, but um, the best score is around 60 and transfuser gets around 50. The, all the methods are still quite far away in terms of infraction score score from being perfect. So if we look here, for example, our expert gets like 86 on the infraction score, but none of the existing sort of Carla challenge methods are there yet, but there is like some uh, level of like perfect root completion. So one of the submissions has really good root completion already. The takeaways from this table for me are that our method, it works quite well with the second rank, despite being a simple end-to-end -end imitation learning method. All the other techniques here have very complicated training pipelines, which you train over a week or so, where there is some imitation learning, some RL, a lot of hand engineered components. Specifically, this LAV on top has, I think, five different networks, and you need to train six different sub training stages to actually get this to run. Um, and we do have a good infraction score. It's the best among all the methods, but we are still not as good in terms of root completion as this best method called LAV, where we get blocked a lot more. Another thing which it's not in this table, but I wanted to just mention is that our driving score is now over 50, which is actually progressing very rapidly overall compared to where we were a year or like a year and a half ago. I think initially there were submissions at 10, 15, 20, but over the last year, we have like steadily progressed up to 60 on this metric already. All right, yeah, so that was the last slide. I can summarize a bit now. The first conclusion would be that this global contextual reasoning is crucial because we saw that it led to a lot of reduced collisions compared to geometry-based fusion in these urban scenarios. And yeah, attention using these transformers is an effective way to aggregate this information from multiple sensors. We also saw that the driving score of a simple imitation learning baseline, which is just like a single end-to-end -end training stage is competitive on this Carla leaderboard. And that um, all this work we did is going to be released soon. Like the extension paper I mentioned and the code release related to that will come out like in a couple of months, I think. And we also have the code from the CVPR paper and a follow up to that from ICCV available already, which actually contains a lot of elements of what we do in the challenge. So. I would encourage anyone who is interested in this challenge or in self-driving in general to take a look at this. And it should be like a nice starter code for getting into this end-to-end um, -end driving and the Scarla challenge. Yeah. So this is it for my slide. And yeah, thanks. I can either answer some questions now or I do have like some videos or maybe like also a couple of things about other work. So let me know what I should do. Yeah, thanks.
If you have videos, that would be cool. So, sorry for, okay. for interrupting. We love videos. Yeah, let me see if that works. So I also have a bunch of questions, but let's let, let's take a look at the video. You can see the video, right? N not yet, no. Okay. Maybe I should stop sharing and share again. Okay, now you should see a video. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I hope it's okay over Zoom. So this is uh, played a bit fast. So it's at double the actual simulation speed, but you can get an idea of how our simulator works. This is our transfuser model driving around. You can see this town, there's like dense traffic. Um, and the black car in the middle is our ego vehicle. It needs to do this unprotected turn here, which it does kind of reasonably. And yeah, you can see that the graphics are not super photorealistic. So on the top left here, I'm showing these auxiliary predictions of the network. It's like depth and semantic predictions. And I think that uh, despite this not being the main task and we don't evaluate very carefully on it, our network does quite well at predicting these things. Um, and we also show here on the top right, the bird's eye view predictions. So that's the predicted HD map and the predicted waypoints in white. The first two waypoints are in blue. So yeah, it's there's a lot going on. So I'll like stop talking for a bit, but yeah, you can just have a look at how we drive. Yeah, I like the Kala Cola truck, <laughs> the red one. Um, yeah, yeah, for the audience, if, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead. But this for me, always amazing on this Kala task is really how uh, people, if they don't encode explicit latent inductive biases for things such as traffic lights, that the vehicle still learns to, to follow traffic lights. It's kind of. Yeah. So one thing which was really important for getting the traffic lights right, which I kind of breezed over in the talk was the sensor configuration. So mm -hmm. traffic lights occur in surprisingly diverse locations on your, on your image. So there's some traffic lights which are like literally like two meters away from you and on one side and you see them like in a few pixels at the far right side of the image. And then there are some which are like really far away, like 50 meters away or something. And they're like two pixels on the top of the image, like the very top row. So you need to configure your sensors, right? Do not miss them. But I agree that it's surprising that you actually can learn to detect these like two pixels of traffic light and stop for them, start when they go green. Yeah. It's also like a bit important to mine your data set around traffic lights. So these routes I talked about earlier are sort of sampled at intersections densely. So you see a lot of these traffic light transitions from red to green and so on. Oh, it's interesting. So um, because the traffic lights are closer to, um, to the autos, or uh, cars in Europe and in North America, they are on the other side of uh, right. and the section. Have um, both, yeah, we have both kinds basically in the evaluation. Oh, okay. So also, also for an autonomous car, um, the, the sensor placement is then different for a European car and also for a North American car, or is there like an optimal sensor placement? Uh, so not sure about optimal. There are standards like um, certain companies have defined some like sensor suites basically where they sort of provide specifications on where you should place them to get like uh, maximum field of view in a certain way and so on. So like for example, Tesla, they release all their sensor configuration on their website. You can just like download it if you like or like yeah also every company sort of releases these standard configurations but yeah it's not trivial in the end like we also need to like at a very basic level like you can't just put everything in the cent center of the car 
because you want like lidar points so you kind of move it a little bit forward so that you don't hit too many lidar points onto the body of the car itself so yeah there's like a few small things like that so uh thank you for your talk i just have a question related to uh how does this approach uh scale with uh 3d lidars and high resolution images uh so uh, in real self uh driving setting you would have high resolution images and 3d lidars and up to a uh, maybe 75 meters and on highways we would actually want a uh, longer range uh so i was wondering uh what's your take on that so i think in principle like the global context is a good idea when the like there's actually relevant information globally most of the time so if you have mostly redundant information in your sensors it could be better to sort of apply the global step only on a sort of like reduced crop let's say like a smaller area of your complete sensor but still have the rest um how this was reflected in our experiments is that we did try having much larger lidar ranges but because our lidar was super sparse at a very big range we were basically just adding compute to our network for no reason and that's why we kind of reverted back to the smaller range um i think that like so that means that i wouldn't directly scale the method to like bigger um input sizes without changing something else about it like um having some sort of hard filtering as well or like some manually designed filtering basically for where you apply the global attention um i mean it could be as simple as like dropping certain patches in the first layers of fusion which are the like most intensive ones basically not being as global there yeah i'm just imagining a situation where you are on a highway and uh global context matters because like you also want to detect cars that are very far away just because of speed yeah. right um yeah and uh i guess another question related to this uh, somehow is uh did it did you see uh that it mattered when you used uh these attention modules uh, early on or late on uh in the uh feature extractors like throughout the feature so, extractors let me see if i can actually pull up the slides again for that um one second we have like an ablation on this somewhere um it was also a bit surprising to us actually what the results were Let's see. Okay, I have it. I can share again. Yeah. So the um, fusion scales thing is like one ablation on this, where we drop the early fusion layers. So basically, one means we only have a transform at the very last block. and 2 3 means you have like also for the penultimate one and like for the like last three blocks so all of these were much worse than or maybe not much worse but they are kind of worse than having everything but we didn't find some super consistent trend there in the end what surprised me was that like even the very first block matters which like i expected that like these numbers would be closer to this 56 that we have in the end the second part of this table is like within the fusion block how many transformer layers you use this doesn't matter as much so here like four is what we use by default but it also works reasonably well for six for example or eight yeah very interesting thank you Yeah, uh, I'm wondering like how important are the auxiliary losses uh, in your network, uh, which are like uh, predicting the segmentations uh, and depths from RGB images and also from uh, from plate laid up point cloud to HD map. Uh, have you tried yeah. like remove that? Yeah. So 
Let's do this again. Yeah. So uh, this is the ablation on those losses. So actually, like all of them are important in the sense that they all improve the performance. Like if you remove everything, you go from 56 to 44. Um, so they're actually pretty important. Um, each individual one though is maybe not that like, it's not clear that you need everything. For example, if we only remove depth, but if we keep the semantics and the map, you can kind of get the same performance. So predicting the map is the most important, I think. And after that, it's the semantics and the depth. But like, this is also like kind of a controlled setting. I think like when you, like a lot of why this matters a lot is because we have a limited budget on like how much data we collect and how long we train. So I think that like these losses are especially helpful in our setting where we don't use like million scale data set and um, train for a week. Like it's like, because we have like a smaller setting, all these losses help quite a lot. I see, thanks. Yeah. Do we have more questions for Kasha? Yeah, I think I have a few more. I'm sorry, Kasha, I really enjoyed your talk. So now I have a lot of questions. Um, so um, I guess I guess the first question is more a philosophical one because I also worked a little bit on on imitation learning um, and and RL and uh, also using at times also using Carla as benchmark. So what would you feel is the ultimate goal of this? This sounds more critical than it is, uh, than, than it is meant to be, but like, would you say one of the goals of, the, of this type of benchmark is to deploy uh, like in a distant future an imitation learning style algorithm into driving? Or is this benchmark maybe just a means of research for multimodal sensor fusion as if you, you have it in driving? Or is it maybe something completely different? So, for example, imitate because the you know the, the action space is somewhat low dimensional on a car compared to to manipulation robot. Maybe these Carla benchmarks are actually the perfect the perfect means of of understanding the fundamentals of imitation learning better, where you don't have to deal with high dimensional action spaces so or, or maybe something you know these are the three options that come to my mind but maybe in your view it is it is something completely different um yeah so, what is your like uh, higher level feeling feeling about this yeah um i mean i've also been working on this for a couple of years now so i constantly think about this basically like what does it all like stand for in the end I think to me, like the most important goal of this Carla benchmark is that we actually see what the simplest baselines are able to do in comparison to the current most complex systems. So if you think about self-driving, um, how the research in self-driving is going right now, it's like there is no comparison at all like and it has been this way forever so if it's like adopted by enough people i think we at least sort of understand what the complexities of the state of the art systems actually give you in comparison to the very fundamental modular pipeline or simple imitation learning so this i think is the biggest goal but then on top of that I also think that like self-driving is a interesting like problem from the like end-to-end -end perspective because both the perception and control tasks are heavily researched already, but the entire pipeline is not researched that much. So there's like a huge focus on perception for self-driving. So things like motion forecasting, object tracking and so on, which has like grown sort of exponentially while remaining as like this offline evaluation standard, like you just measure mm -hmm. 
um, offline metrics on like how far were the trajectories and so on. And um, you also have like a very big control community who people who do planning and like do things on very complicated control tasks like quadrupeds or something, which is like much harder than a car. But like, it's not fully applied to cars, like to self-driving cars. Um, what I think is that the self-driving problem specifically in simulation is like a nice place to see like which solutions from these communities fit together well, because you have like a very advanced perception task and a very advanced in some sense, like a uh, control task in terms of like how close to solve it is or something. Maybe that's a wrong word for it, but you can sort of put these things together and understand where they pair well. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's like a good representative of real world self-driving though, in the sense that not every finding you get in Carla, including what we have with like the sense of fusion idea via transformers is guaranteed to directly work the same way in the real world. Um, we do like try to focus our, our research on things which are very likely to transfer. So like, there's no fundamental reason basically why this wouldn't work in the real world. But yeah, it's like, this is sort of like a way to find promising things that you could then try in the real world on like real data sets and cars. Um, yeah, and if you talk about not Carla, but simulated driving in general, I think that this is like really the next big step in terms of like, getting photorealistic rendering to simulators via like these like data driven rendering or like view synthesis like basically all the computer graphics advances and getting more realistic traffic behaviors and so on it will probably like really lead to some point where you can so decouple the data collection process for self-driving from the actual training and testing so you try to kind of build this simulator, which is like as close to the real world as possible. And then like the research we do in Carla gives a framework for how do you do things for self-driving models when you have a simulator. And this can be applied when we have much better simulators at some point. Yeah, I mean, this was ultimately my hope as well, but what you said, uh, said about planning, <laughs> And or, or the full stack is spot on. My impression is also that compared, compared to classical perception tasks or compared to a very narrow definition of control, there is no unified baseline, even for planning. Like there is no de not that planning standard benchmark. People use very similar metrics in planning papers, but there is no such thing like as the image net competition for planning. So I have in, the, in that context, maybe one, one more question. If you, if you look like now there are more, more and more things emerging in that space, if you look at benchmarks, I think such as new plan, I didn't have yeah. much time to look into it myself yet, but how, how do you see them as, um, as, uh, as self-driving benchmarks in comparison to things such as Carla? I am like very optimistic about new plan being useful. Um, I think like, the main advantage it has is that new scenes is already like adopted quite a lot in motion forecasting. Yeah. So there's a chance that that entire community will also start working on new plan. And the for people working on Carla, it is a fairly simple step because you're just dropping the perception. So it's like you're doing exactly the same thing, but you're not doing perception anymore. You just have that, that for free. So like we also have projects on planning for Carla currently, and we always use like a off the shelf perception system and then do our planning on top of that right now. Whereas like mm -hmm. if new plan becomes available when they say it does, I think they promised like Q2 2022 or something. So like in the next couple of months, I think um, it would just be like a good second verification of results along with the Carla stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I still think the Carla thing is going to be interesting because 
the Carla team works quite hard on also upgrading their benchmark all the time. So this year there's going to be like a new challenge which has like more of these hand engineered scenarios in like very specific ways. So I mm-hmm. think they'll be complementary to each other eventually. And like hopefully sort of the community starts using both for the specific advantages of the two things. Basically you can do closed loop sensor simulation in Carla, which you can't do in new plan. Mm-hmm. And you can get like realistic traffic behaviors in new plan, which you currently can't get in Carla. Um, I have a question. I missed maybe uh, the new plan, but um, it doesn't have a closed loop simulation for planning, I guess. It doesn't have closed loop sensor simulation. So what they can do, and they won't do it for the first release, but Mm -hmm. what they sort of promised is that they can add like either hand coded or ML based policies to all the other actors in the driving log. So they've collected a driving log and your task is to like do something similar to Carla within that driving log. You need to go from a start point to a destination Mm -hmm. while avoiding collisions and so on. But whereas like classical benchmarks can only replay the motion of the other actors as it was in the original log, what new plan has promised is that they can also like drive the other actors using simple policies, which are like maybe partly machine learning based and partly hand designed or something like this. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, there have been some simulation environments which adopted IDM intelligent driver model, but at the end, uh, the neural net learned uh, uh, how to deal with intelligent driver model, nothing more. Yeah. So yeah. it's good to have some mixture of policies. Thanks. Yeah. Hmm. We have some follow-up questions. Lokasha, do you have another video? <laughs> I can show you how it fails. That's maybe a better <laughs> okay. video. Yeah, those are the best videos. Uh, give me a second. Um, yeah, so... Um, the way the method fails is also quite simplistic and this sort of motivates like looking at like planning and like better ways to plan. So I have like a short video on the failures here. So this happens sometimes it's called the inertia or causal confusion problem. It's quite commonly observed in imitation based self-driving. So I'll just play it again. It just, the car doesn't move even though it has no reason to stay still the like it does like predict that like some waypoints far into the future should move the car forward but the very first waypoints which decide the control action are too close to each other and this is kind of an artifact of having in the training set a lot of situations where if the car is still it stays still and it therefore doesn't move and gets blocked. So this is like one of the failure cases and having a like explicit planner with some cost functions to encourage progress, like would fix this. Um, uh, Second one is like, so after we see this, so currently it can't negotiate. So it gets into this intersection and kinds of gets into like a stare off with another actor, doesn't skirt around it. And the model is also not great at um, objects which are not prominently visible in the camera. So here there was a truck and it had to turn, kind of ignored the truck because it was like barely visible in the camera. And you'll see that again here, it needs to change lane. It's gonna ignore something which is hard to see basically. So it doesn't use the LIDAR enough is another way to put this. Yeah, so those were like some of the like main failures. Uh, Interesting thing is that they are like trivial in some sense. It doesn't fail in some like very difficult ways where like it doesn't fail in human like ways. That's another way to put it. It fails in other like simple areas. 
Um, Kasia, what's the planning horizon of the uh, path points, waypoints? So we don't actually explicitly do planning. We just have a PID yeah. controller on top of the waypoints, but we do train the network to predict waypoints for two seconds or four seconds. We have some operations on this. Mm -hmm. It works um, like two seconds was sort of the optimum for Carla. Um, and it's like also dependent on the exact architecture and losses in that experiment, but nothing super long basically in terms of what the network does. But also it's like, it is an instantaneous decision. So we don't have an explicit planner like a uh, tree search or like, uh, like trajectory based cost optimization going on. This is really the simplest imitation learning based thing you could have a uh, current network, which also kind of explains why like a lot of the failures I showed you are not going to happen with a planner. Yeah, this planning horizon explains, in fact, some of the failures, as you mentioned. Yeah. The other thing I was also considering is, um, yeah, you employ some MPC. And for example, in the second uh, getting stuck scenario, I guess, um, you didn't you couldn't imitate this because the mpc found a solution with a perf with some perfect information and um, the neural network couldn't imitate learn any such behavior from the mpc planner if you would yeah. maybe use something else maybe your architecture would be able to deal with such scenarios it's a very important point like um Actually, we had to simplify our expert to improve the learned policy already. So the MPC I mentioned that we used for our privilege policy, we also actually really limited the action space there. We didn't let the model sort of swerve around things too much and so on, because we found that even if you make the expert perform better through all these complicated maneuvers, mm -hmm. the actual trained model was worse. Like when oh. you allowed a lot of flexibility to the expert. So in the end, the expert we use actually didn't swerve around things. It was mainly like making this longitudinal control decision based on model predictive control and sticking to the center of the route. Okay. And that's why like also the learned model doesn't go around things. It tries to stick to the center of the route basically. And in terms of like this, like, the way the benchmark currently is, it's basically better to use this like simpler expert, even though it is not as good. And that was very interesting to us. So we also have better versions of the expert, which hopefully like as the models get better, we can also switch to the next expert and mm -hmm. try to learn the next set of challenging behaviors. Okay. Thanks. Do we have more questions? No, I don't think it's uh, the case. Uh, thank you again, Kasper, for, for this uh, great talk and also for answering all, all these uh, questions and, and also for showing like a uh, video with uh, failures. It's really, really nice. Yeah, happy to be here and yeah, thanks for the opportunity.